Hello, my name is Walter Mack, and today we will be doing a brief overview of approach to shoulder MRI with attention to just the process um, uh, checklist approach to interpretation. And basically, I'm just going to go over how I approach a shoulder MRI when I'm picking up off the list for dictation. And so we're going to begin actually with a comment about the localizer image. So unlike the knee, the localizer which the tech does to ensure that the patient is positioned properly within the scanner um, actually shows you a lot of anatomy that isn't shown on the subsequent diagnostic sequences. So it's important to at least spend a few seconds reviewing the localizer images and ensuring that there's not a uh, huge lung cancer or a spine lesion or something like that um, hiding on the images that we would be responsible for reporting and alerting the clinicians about. Okay, so having dispensed with that, we get to the actual case itself. And in general, uh, the checklist I follow for shoulder MRI includes the rotator cuff, then I look at the acromion, the AC joint, we'll talk about acromion morphology. Um, I'll look at the subacromial bursa and we'll talk about uh, that bursa and other bursae. Then I look at the glenohumeral joint and then the glenoid labrum. Um, and then I finish off by uh, looking at things with I, that I'd like to put in the miscellaneous category. Um, things like marrow signal, um, whether or not there are bone or soft tissue masses, things like that, axillary adenopathy, so on and so forth. Okay, so let's begin with the rotator cuff. And when I'm looking at the rotator cuff, I actually like starting with the sagittal sequence. And the reason for that is I feel like the sagittal sequence is the best sequence for explicitly telling you which muscle and which tendon you're dealing with. So this is on the top image here, our sagittal MRI sequence. Uh, this is a fluid sensitive fat saturated sequence. It could either be T2 fat set or proton density fat set. I believe this is a proton density fat set. That's not ter terribly critical to know at this point. Um, it is nice to be able to be able to identify which is anterior and which is posterior on the image. And on an image like this, it's very easy. Here you have your clavicle, here you have your chromium, here you have your um, coracoid process. Um, and also note too that the shoulder tends to be oriented and to superior to posterior inferior. Um, so it will always have this sloped uh, obliquity to it. And you can use that too to help you determine what's anterior and what's posterior. But as you do more and more of these cases, there will be numerous hints that will tell you which is anterior which is posterior. So as you know, the subscapularis tendon, which is uh, this tendon right here anteriorly uh, inserts onto the lesser tuberosity, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, and teres minor, as you know, insert onto the greater tuberosity. Okay, so the sagittal shows the tendons quite nicely and the muscles as well as the chrono. So those are the uh, main sequences that we would use for interpreting the rotator cuff. And just like tendons elsewhere, uh, as you can imagine, the rotator cuff tendon should demonstrate homogeneous low signal on all sequences. We briefly talked about magic angle artifact when we looked at the knee, and unfortunately, uh, that artifact rears its ugly head again, especially in the chrono images, and especially if you're looking at a proton density fat saturated sequence or proton density non fat saturated sequence, again, any short TE sequence, you're going to notice right here in the so called critical zone, which is a centimeter. Uh, proximal to the insertion of the rotator cuff, in this case supraspinatus, that there may often be artifactual increased signal uh, reflecting magic angle artifact. Unfortunately, this is a good location to have tendon gnosis as well. So um, you'll have to just kind of read around it. If you have a T2 fat saturated sequence, it's helpful to look at that because you shouldn't have magic angle artifact on a long TE sequence such as a T2. Okay, for um, for now, we'll just kind of consider this a real finding. So when you see gray signal within the rotator cuff, um, but not quite fluid signal, then generally we would call that tendinosis. If you see fluid signal, okay, so signal that's, say, as bright as, as this trace of fluid in the bicepital groove, then um, we would start calling that a tear, okay? And if you diagnose a rotator cuff tear, then the first order of business is to ask yourself, well, which, which tendon is it involving? And then the next order of business is to ask yourself, is this a full thickness tear? 
or is this a partial thickness tear? A full thickness tear is one that involves the entire cross-sectional thickness of the rotator cuff. A partial tear involves only part of the cross-sectional thickness. Okay, so let's deal with full thickness cuff tears first. Okay, um, If you see a full thickness cuff tear, i.e. one that involves an entire cross-sectional thickness, and therefore extends from the so-called articular surface, so this surface here which um, communicates with the, the joint, and then this surface here which is the bursal surface, um, then you have a full thickness cuff tear. And if you do see such a tear, once again you should say which tendon it's in, you should measure the size of the tendon tear in preferably two dimensions, medial lateral and anteroposterior on your sagittal sequence. And then you should also give some rough estimation as to how far back the tendon has been retracted from the um, insertion or the footprint. Okay, And that's usually just as a simple approximate kind of as the bird flies measurement uh, will suffice. Um, alternatively, what you can do is be descriptive and say that you see retraction to the top of the humor head, retraction to the glenoid, retraction proximal to the glenoid, and, and that would be acceptable as well. In the setting of a full thickness cuff tear, you should also try to ascertain how much fatty atrophy you see in the respective muscle belly, uh, because this would give some indication as to the chronicity of the tear. So, what I'd like to do for that is look on a non-fat saturated sequence such as this chrono PD and ask yourself is there increased fatty marbling within the muscle obviously this is a normal supraspinous muscle here and you're going you're to image a lot of patients that are kind of middle aged to elderly and they'll have generalized atrophy and the, the question really is is the supraspinatus if the full thickness cuff tear involves supraspinatus is the supraspinatus uh, atrophy out of proportion to atrophy in other muscles such as the deltoid for example or the trapezius I like to use the trapezius as an internal control at times and if the answer is yes then I would call that atrophy and the answer is no then I would I might say something like no specific fatty atrophy of the supraspinatus or something like that um, and they used to talk about um, with regards to supraspinous, how much the muscle belly fills the so-called supraspinous fossa, as shown here, as a means of determining if there's atrophy or not. Unfortunately, there is a potential pitfall with that. For example, let's say you have an acute supraspinous tendon tear, but there's a lot of retraction, right? Then you can see that this sag kind of cuts through around here on the coronal. Then what may end up happening is, since the whole muscle muscle and tendon junction and tendon are retracted approximately, your sagittal image here might actually be cutting through the distal muscle belly, and so it may not fill the supraspinous fossa completely, and so you may erroneously call atrophy of the supraspinous muscle when in fact it's just markedly retracted. Um, so uh, I, I tend to actually rely more heavily on how much marbling uh, fat, fatty infiltration of the muscle there is rather than the overall bulk, although if you're careful and you look at bulk on both sequences, you you can use bulk as well to help you. Alright, um, now what if we have a partial thickness tear? So if we have a partial thickness tear, let's just use supraspinous again as an example, then that actually opens up a whole different menu of questions for you to answer, and of course these should be answered in the report as well. So once again, which tendon? So we, we said supraspinatus. And then you should say if the partial tear extends to the articular side, okay, so if it communicates with the joint side of the tendon, or if it communicates with the bursal surface fibers, so bursal sided tear, or it might actually communicate with neither, and it's a so-called intrasubstance tear, which potentially could be occult at arthroscopy, so that's important to note as well. So is it articular sided, bursal sided, or intrasubstance, then you should of course give measurement of the tear in two dimensions, anterior posterior medial lateral on your side and chrono as we talked about for full thickness cuff tears. And I like to give some semi-quantitative assessment as to how bad the tear is. Does it involve say 50% of the cross-sectional thickness of the tendon? I may call that intermediate grade partial thickness tear. If it's less than 50% low grade, greater than 50% high grade, so on and so forth. Sometimes you'll see a partial tear that has bursal and articular sided components and which is simply describing as such um, high high grade partial thickness supraspinous tendon tear with bursal and articular surface components. And I think that would that would work just fine. Um, 
then we simply repeat that same exercise with all the other rotator cuff tendons. So supraspinatus, infraspinatus, teres minor, and subscapularis. Uh, before I forget, I just want to point out that the subscapularis tendon has a multi-pennate appearance, okay? Uh, meaning that it looks like it's kind of multiple tendons kind of joining to form one tendon at the insertion. And this can give rise to some apparent heterogeneity in the appearance, also on ultrasound. So be careful not to overcall tendinosis in the subcapillaris um, because of this multi pennate appearance. Okay, great. Uh, pitfalls. Uh, let's see, there's one pitfall that comes immediately to mind. Let's say we have a far uh, lateral sagittal image like so, and we see only fluid signal here. Only fluid signal, okay? Let's go actually go, go a lot of one more image. Just fluid signal, so based on what I had just told you, you would say, oh, it's a full thickness for a cuff tear. But before we do that, we should actually immediately correlate with the chrono. And once again, as is a common theme in my discussions on MRI, it's important, at least when you're starting out, to always correlate what you're seeing on one sequence with um, another sequence to ensure that you're seeing things exactly the way as they are, rather than misinterpreting something on the one sequence. Okay, so let's say it's all fluid signal here in supraspinatus. Then we should immediately go to the chrono sequence and we should ask ourselves, at that specific location, what is the status of the articular surface fibers, okay? So we look at the articular surface fibers, and if they're smooth and, the and they're intact, then you're actually dealing with a high-grade partial thickness bursal surface tear of supraspinatus rather than a full thickness cuff tear. And the reason why this doesn't show on the Sag is because the footprint is, you know, has a medial lateral width to it. So you could conceivably have a partial thickness bursal surface tear Okay, that's going to look like a full thickness tear because if you have a far lateral sagittal image, it's only going to cut through the tear and it's not going to show you that, oh, the articular surface fibers are actually intact. So this is the sort of mistake I, was, I would make even as a fellow, but um, I, I hope that all of you will not make that same error. Uh, the other point I want to make is not really a pitfall, but uh, sometimes you'll see a tear involving the posterior fibers of supraspinatus. Okay, so sometimes people will talk about tears involving either the anterior leading edge, the mid fibers, or posterior uh, fibers. And it gets actually hard to tell if you're dealing with a tear in supraspinatus or infraspinatus. Uh, in truth, anatomically, what happens at the so-called supraspinatus hyphen infraspinatus interval is that the fibers crisscross. So these days I actually don't spend too much time fussing about which tendon it is if it's kind of at near this junction area. I would just say there's a rotator cuff tear at the supraspinatus infraspinatus interval. Um, you know, it's, people can describe it in different ways. You could you could say it's in the posterior fibers of supraspinatus and involving the anterior le leading edge fibers of infraspinatus. I think that would be fine too. When you're on your chronal sequence, uh, you know, I, I encourage you to use the sagittal to, to detect which rotator cuff tendon you're dealing with, but if you're on the chrono, another way to tell is, if you see that the muscle belly is horizontal, then that generally corresponds to supraspinatus, all right? And you see that the muscle belly is somewhat obliquely oriented, then you're actually dealing with infraspinatus. So that's another little tip if you only have the chrono for whatever reason, or if you're being shown a chrono in rounds or something, and you don't, you're not privy to the whole sequence. Okay, so that's the rotator cuff. Um, before we leave rotator to cuff, I want to make special comments about subscapularis before we talk about biceps. Subscapularis, I think, is the hardest uh, of the four cuff tendons to read, um, and, and let me illustrate why. So I think a lot of people, and myself included, we use the axial, actually, to look at subscapularis, and here it is here, okay? And you assess it the way you would assess the other rotator cuff tendons, intermediate signal, or heterogeneity, tendinosis, fluid signal, tear, and then we go on to the partial versus full thickness discussion that we just had. Um, I think using the axial in isolation can be tricky because let's say I have an image like that, all right? And, you know, it, we can see subscapulars here, but then over here it looks attenuated. And is there a tear here? I don't know. So whenever I look at subscapulars, I actually have either the sagittal and or coronal, preferably both, on at the same time because the sagittal and the coronal define for you where the superior margin of subscapularis is. So we can see as we kind of correlate uh, 
we can see that this axial image here is actually above the superior margin of subscapularis. At least that's how it seems here. Let's pull up our chrono. Let's drive anteriorly. So this is the superior margin of subscapularis. And yes, so you see we're how we're just above the superior margin of subscapularis. So this is actually a difficult image to use to assess subscapularis. We scroll more inferiorly. And we can see that in fact the subscapularis tendon actually looks quite intact there. All right. Okay. Um, I find that increasingly subscapularis tendon pathology is related to biceps tendon pathology. So increasingly, I'm reading the biceps when I read the subscapularis tendon. So while I have the axial sequence up, let's let's just uh, talk about where we expect to see the biceps. So I think early on in the case, it's worthwhile to spend maybe five or ten seconds asking yourself what degree of external rotation is the patient's shoulder in. We ask all our patients to externally rotate their shoulder, but some um, can't keep the position or some won't keep the position. And so you have to kind of assess how much external rotation that is, do you see in the joint. And why this is helpful is because it will tell you, it will give you some indication as to where you should look on your chrono and sagittal for the biceps tendon. So here they actually have a pretty good degree of external rotation. So this is your lesser tuberosity, this is your subscap we just talked about, this is your greater tuberosity here, and this is your biceps tendon. Okay, so we fall proximally and we can see the biceps tendon kind of originating from the expected location of the superior labrum. And then it's traversing through this space called the rotator interval, which we'll talk about in a second. And then distally, you can see it in the bicipital groove. <laughs> It's a bit of an oversimplification, but for now, I just want you to accept that the bicipital groove is intraticular. So if you see trace fluid in the bicipital groove, as you see here, then that's actually normal. Okay, so let's just find the biceps on the chrono. Um, so here's the superior labrum, and it's this structure here. So since they're excellently rotated, we expect the biceps to come up quite lateral before we see it going down into the bicipital groove. If they were internally rotated, you might actually see the biceps coming down fairly anteriorly. And if you don't go through that exercise, then conceivably it's possible to mistake either the short head of biceps or even corcobrachialis anteriorly for the long head of biceps. So that's why I encourage you to um, do that whole exercise about how much internal or external rotation the shoulder is in. We find that the um, sagittal sequence is especially uh, helpful for assessing the intracapsular portion of biceps, i.e. that portion of the biceps that comes off the superior labrum, traverses through the rotator interval prior to uh, entering the bicepal groove. And we assess the biceps tendon just like any other tendon. If it's thick and heterogeneous tendinosis, if we see fluid signal uh, tears either partial or full thickness, if we don't see it, then we postulate a complete rupture. Uh, you might see an attenuated biceps tendon, and I would generally consider that a, a, a good sign for a partial thickness tear as well. So you've heard me mention two or three times now about the rotator interval. What is the rotator interval? It is an anatomic space that is uh, marginated uh, by the base of the coracoid medially, uh, supraspinatus, superiorly, uh, inferiorly by subscapularis and the humeral head. Okay, And I like to liken this space as to that of a triangular prism. So if the base of that triangular prism is the base of the coracoid, then the apex of that triangular prism is where that biceps tendon enters the bicipital groove. And so obviously the rotator interval is going to include the, bice, uh, the biceps tendon. And then some of you may also wonder what this little guy is here. This is the biceps tendon pulley. And it is formed by the superior glenohumeral ligament and the corcohumeral ligament. I don't think it's critical to know that right now. I just pointed out since it's sitting there and you're probably wondering what it is. Um, the two ligaments together help to keep the biceps uh, stabilized and in this location and keep it from subluxing anteriorly. But once again, for your first few MR interpretations, I don't think it's critical to know about the biceps pulley. But now you know about it. All right. The reason why I read biceps with subscapularis is very often when you have a partial tear of subscapularis, especially a partial thing that's articular surface tear of subscapularis, then you may see subluxation of the mid of biceps. Sometimes it's easy, it's frank dislocation. You see an empty bicep or groove and the biceps tendon, if you judiciously follow it up and down, you can actually see it's actually uh, immediately dislocated into that subscapularis tendon tear defect. But sometimes it's subtle and it's just subtly perched medially uh, on the lesser tuberosity, okay, so very subtle subluxation. And 
I find that when you have this combination of subscapularis tendon tear and medial subluxation of biceps, it can be hard to pick up both. Um, the biceps, the, the subscapularis tendon tear actually might be less apparent as well because the fluid defect that you're hoping to see is actually less evident because it's occupied by the subluxed biceps tendon. So this is where you just kind of have to go back and forth on your axials and chronals, sometimes sagittals, and just ask yourself, is this biceps tendon making it all the way into the groove, or is it kind of doing a little shortcut like this? So you can see this biceps tendon comes all the way out and then comes straight down, all right? So here's the biceps here, okay? Um, but if there were a partial tear of subscapularis here, then what you might see is the biceps coming down across like this and then doing like something like this, kind of cutting the corners before getting the bicepital groove, and that would be a sign of a um, biceps subluxation. Uh, I'm simplifying things a little. You, in truth, can actually have bicep subluxation without a subscapularis tendon tear, but for now, let's just assume that we have a sublux biceps that there is an underlying subscapularis tendon tear. And so if you see one, you should look for the other. And generally, again, that's why I tend to read both together, because I find that most of the time I end up reading both together anyway, trying to figure out what's going on. Okay, so that's my blurb on rotator cuff and biceps. That's a huge um, chunk of the interpretation right there. Now let's shift gears and look at the AC joint and the acromion. Um, so the AC joint is actually fairly easy to, to assess. Uh, here's your distal clavicle on your chronos and here's your acromion. And most cases you'll read will show some degree of OA. So osteophytes, edema, cysts, uh, capsular hypertrophy and the like. And that's fine. Just be sure that before you call it OA, whatever you're seeing at the AC joint, that it indeed is o OA. And so, for example, an example of something that superficially might look like OA but isn't OA is if you have post-traumatic osteolysis of the distal clavicle, which is essentially just a stress fracture of the distal clavicle. And the giveaway would be you have edema in the distal clavicle only and minimal or no edema in the associated chromium, suggesting that you're actually doing a bone-centered process, not a joint-centered process. And then really look for that subchondral linear low signal indicating the actual fracture. The other pitfall is, let's say uh, the patient had had, a, say, a type 1 or type 2 AC separation, then you might see uh, capsular edema, capsular disruption, and marrow, reactive marrow edema, and that superficially could look like OA as well. So there you want to look for offset of the AC joint if it's a type 2 AC separation. And not part of my routine search pattern, but I think it may be worthwhile to actually look at the corticoclavicular ligaments as well if you're suspecting that you may actually be dealing with an AC separation. Um, so the corticoclavicular ligaments have two components, lateral conoid component and medial trapezoidal component. Uh, and, you know, as, as you can Imagine with other ligaments, it, you're going to expect to see a nice striated appearance and uninterrupted fibers. Here it is on the crony, you can just look for edema. But if it's, a, if it's an old separation, you might not see edema, but you might actually see ossification. Instead, once again, plain foam correlation, often helpful in this regard. And just to illustrate where these ligaments are on the sagittal, what you would do is just find the clavicle and then follow it back. And these guys here are your corticoclavicular ligaments. Okay, so I don't necessarily dictate the corticoclavicular ligaments are intact in every single case that I read, but when it's relevant, so when you when you really suspect that there's an AC separation, then I think this does become relevant, and I would dictate the status of these ligaments. And this tends to be a favorite OSCE blank as well. Another good reason to know about that. Okay, so that's the AC joint, very easy. We've, we've done the um, rotator cuff, including biceps, AC joint. Now let's spend a couple of minutes talking about acromial morphology. So on your most lateral images, that's, I would say, the lateral three images. That's where you assess acromial morphology. As you can imagine, most rotator cuff um, or shoulder MRs are actually done to look at the rotator cuff. So in addition to looking at the rotator cuff, uh, looking at acromial morphology is important because we may find um, features that could predispose to rotator cuff impingement. And very oftentimes when a patient undergoes rotator cuff repair at surgery, they also get a, a decompression. So this is helpful information. So a type 1 acromion basically has a flat undersurface, as we see here, okay? Uh, a type 2 acromion has a curved, concave, inferior morphology, and a type 3 acromion has a hook uh, 
at the enter aspect. And that hook, you can just imagine that digging into the rotator cuff every time the patient kind of forward flexes their shoulder or abducts their shoulder. And so that is something that could predispose to the patient. So it's a type 3 um, acromion that, that can give predisposition to rotator cuff impingement. And when I report these acromions, um, I actually don't give a type 1, type 2, type 3. I just say if it's hooked or not, because that's really the important feature. The very rare type 4 acromion is actually convex inferior and that could impinge as well but that I've seen that maybe one or two of those in my entire career so I won't worry too much about that. Um, in addition to having a type 3 acromion you can actually have a subacromian thesophyte at the uh, acromion anteriorly and that too can behave essentially like a type 3 acromion and cause rotator to cuff impingement and how do we find a uh, subacromian thesophyte. What I like to do is kind of start at the coracoid and you have a thin ligament called the corcoacromal ligament that's going to run from the coracoid to the acromion and once I find that, so here's the ligament, you can see this little black structure here once I find that ligament attaching to the acromion, I ask myself right here is there an osseous excrescence? If the answer is yes, they have a subacromial thesophyte and if the answer is no, then they don't. Um, shockingly, you can actually find this quite nicely on the chronos as well. So let's just go through that. So here's a coracoid, and let's see, I would say maybe that's a coracoid ligament, follow it across, and then you're going to see, okay, there's there's just the anterior leaning edge of the acromion, and on the chrono generally it will appear as a sessile comma broad-based excrescence, bony excrescence, right at the coracoid ligament attachment. Okay. Um, some people will talk about AC joint osteophytes, okay, which are, are more medial, as you can imagine, as well, because they can predispose to so-called inlet impingement of the supraspinatus. So all of these things get decompressed at surgery. So I think it's worthwhile to talk about all of these things when you're dealing with your rotator cuff type case uh, for your shoulder MRI. Okay, so we've talked about rotator cuff. We've talked about biceps, acromomorphology, AC joint. Now let's spend a minute or two talking about bursae, and I think um, the most important one is obviously the subacromial subdeltoid bursa, and as the name would imply, this is a potential space that um, we see deep to the deltoid muscle. So it's, you see this thin high signal band, that's the bursa itself, and of course it's subacromial in location as well. And as you can see, as in the normal situation, it's a potential space, so, so it's actually collapsed and devoid of, of fluid for the most part. If we see a lot of fluid in this bursa, okay, and by a lot I mean it's actually starting to extend lateral, deep to the lateral deltoid muscle, then that conjures up a differential. But more important than the differential is, is an invitation to go back and look at the rotator cuff. So if you see a lot of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa and you have not yet diagnosed a full thickness cuff tear, then I would go back and look at the rotator cuff again and make sure that you don't have a full thickness cuff tear because that's probably one of the most common reasons to have a lot of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Right? Because you can imagine if you have a through and through tear, full thickness tear, then your joint fluid is just going to seep along here and communicate through that full thickness cuff tear and then just kind of settle in the subacromal subdeltoid bursa. And in fact, back in the old days, when they diagnosed rotator cuff tears at conventional arthrography, they, that's how they would actually diagnose a, a full thickness cuff tear. They would put your needle down here, inject contrast into the joint, and look under fluoro to see if any of that contrast made its way into the subacromial cell deltoid bursa and if they saw that then that was pretty good evidence for a full thickness rotator cuff tear at conventional arthrography. Okay, so why else might you have a lot of fluid in the subacromial subdeltoid bursa? Well, it could simply be subacromial subdeltoid bursitis, either mechanical, um, either because of underlying inflammatory arthritis, or even underlying low-grade infection. Okay. Um, alternatively, maybe uh, someone had actually just injected okay, the shoulder, maybe a therapeutic injection, or maybe someone was trying to do an arthrogram and got into the bursa instead. Then you might also see a lot of fluid in the bursa. So usually it's, it's fairly straightforward to sort out between all these possibilities. Um, you might hear about something called the subcorcoid bursa as well. And that actually you communicates with the subacromial uh, subdeltoid bursa as well. And so that is something you should think of when you see fluid uh, 
directly anterior to the subscapularis muscle slash tendon. All right, so if you see fluid in this location, that's abnormal and it, it um, warrants investigation and explanation. And a lot of the time, it's actually because there's fluid in the subacromal subdeltoid bursa that's just now communicating with the subcorcoid bursa. Uh, another good explanation is someone attempted an arthrogram, and so as, as I was saying, you put your needle down on the medial humeral head, but let's say you didn't have your needle right down on bone and you're actually a little more superficial than it should have been, then quite conceivably you deposit a whole bunch of contrast into the subcorcoid bursa uh, rather than going into the joint. And how that would look on fluoro for those of you who are about to undertake shoulder arthrography is you put your needle down, you think you're in, you inject, and you just get this blob of contrast that just kind of surrounds the needle there. That's a pretty good look for a subcorcoid bursal injection. All right. How do we distinguish the subcorcoid bursa from the subscapularis recess. Okay, so those are actually two different things. Unfortunately, some people use those terms interchangeably, which which I say is unfortunate because one's extraarticular, the subcorcoid bursa is extraarticular, the other subscapularis recess is actually intraarticular. So let's say you see fluid that's that's kind of at the super margin of subscapularis and you can see it going up and over the super margin of subscapularis. That's a good uh, distribution for fluid in the intraarticular subscapularis recess. All right, that should not be confused with fluid directly anterior to the subcoracoid, to the subscapularis um, muscle, which is fluid in the extraarticular subcoracoid bursa. So let's say you put your needle down, you're doing an arthrogram, and you see contrast squirting out, and it, you see it watching, you watch it go up and then under the coracoid process. That is actually fluid in your subscapularis recess. It's intraarticular. That's a great sign if you're doing an MR arthrogram at that point. Then you tell the tech to capture that image, and you inject the GAD, and then you're going to be done really soon. So that's a really good sign. But like as I said before, you see the contrast collecting near the needle, not really going anywhere else, probably in the extraarticular subcoracoid bursae. Okay, so I think this bursal analysis becomes important when you see abnormal fluid in the bursa. Usually you'll be making comments about fluid in the sub subdeltoid bursa. And of course, I don't call it bursitis, um, the fluid in the subcormo bursa, if there's a full thickness cuff tear, because I, I generally assume that all the fluid in that bursa is secondary to communication from joint fluid through the full thickness cuff tear. All right, so we've talked about the rotator cuff, including biceps. We talked about the AC joint. We talked about uh, chromomorphology, features predisposing to cuff impingement, and bursae. Now we're going to drill down a bit and look at the joint itself. And so for that, I've got some MR arthrographic images, which I think might show things a little bit more clearly. Okay, so these are T1 fat saturated sequences obtained after intraticular injection of gadolinium. And let's start with joint first. So the joint you can pretty much assess just like you assess any joint in the knee. Okay, so um, once again the articular cartilage is for the most part going to have this nice intermediate signal. Remember that the deeper cartilage is going to be almost black and remember that not all of this black is subconjugal bone plate. Some of this is actually cartilage. Remember how we talked about if we saw signal heterogeneity which admittedly is very subjective then we would call mild chondrosis or grade 1 chondrosis for those who like to number um, their chondrosis. If we see some thinning, but not full thickness thinning, then we're either dealing with moderate chondrosis or grade 2 or grade 3. If you'd like to number these, I might call it grade 2 if it's less than 50% of the thickness. Uh, if it's more than 50% thickness, I might call it grade, th grade 3. Um, and then if we see secondary bone changes, cyst formation or edema, then that's a good um, indication that we have full thickness cartilage denuding and we call it grade 4 or severe chondrosis. And as we talked about in the knee, I think it's helpful too to talk about whether or not the chondrosis you're seeing is generalized involving the entire joint or focal. And if it's focal and you think it's acute or it's, it's an actual discrete osteochondral injury, then it may be worthwhile to um, give measurements as to the size of the region of involvement as well. Um, Sometimes you might see high-grade conjugate defects, as in the knee, on the sagittal sequence. I wouldn't recommend using the sagittal primarily, but sometimes you'll appreciate the actual high-grade defects, the discrete defects, quite nicely in the sagittal as well.
Okay, so I want to pull up the schedule mainly because it's going to help us with the next part of the interpretation, which is the glenoid labrum. And I think the glenoid labrum is the big albatross that makes most of us, myself included, consider the shoulder MR um, a harder study overall to interpret compared to the knee because that we, on an arthrogram, it's not too bad, but when you're looking at the glenoid labrum on a conventional MR, it can be quite tricky. So, um, you know, there will be rules to help us out, but there's going to there will be a lot of instances where it's just a judgment call, and time, experience, volume will help you in this regard. Okay, so the um, glenoid labrum, you can think of it as being somewhat analogous to the knee meniscus. It's this uh, fiber cartilage structure designed to deepen the um, the glenoid to prevent to provide some measure of stability to the inherently unstable glenohumeral articulation. We generally use the uh, chrono to look at the superior labrum and the axial to look at the anterior labrum and the posterior labrum and use the chrono as well to look at the inferior labrum. And in the normal situation, the labrum should be triangular in morphology and homogeneous low signal. The posterior labrum can have a somewhat rounded contour and that can be normal as well. Um, let's talk about localization. So. This here now, this shoulder arthrogram is actually the reverse of that conventional arthrogram I just showed you. So let's orient ourselves. This is a coracoid process. This is anterior. Uh, this is anterior superior. This is posterior inferior. So that's, you know, once again, that sloping I talked about earlier holds here as well. So some people would liken position, positions to uh, positions throughout the labrum to positions on a clock. All right, and for most people. Um, 12 o'clock would denote the superior labrum, okay? Note that it's not necessarily 12 o'clock of the image, it's not the north pole of the image, it's the north pole of the labrum, and because we have this anterior superior posterior inferior tilt of the glenoid and therefore the labrum, then 12 o'clock is going to be here rather than here. Okay, so that's 12 o'clock, then this is 6 o'clock, right, the inferior labrum, anterior is 3 o'clock, posterior is 6 o'clock. There will actually be a subset of people who liken the labrum clock to a clock on the wall. Therefore, 3 o'clock is always the right-hand side of the image. So in this case, um, a person using this alternative clock would also consider this 3 o'clock. But let's say we were looking at a shoulder facing the other way. Then they would consider 3 o'clock to be the posterior labrum. And so because there's this difference in how people use a clock, I tend to be deliberately redundant in my interpretation. So let's say I saw a labral tear right here. Then I would say that there's a focal tear of the posterior superior labrum at the 10 o'clock position. So posterior superior, so I've denoted the location in one way and then at the 10 o'clock position. For those who use the same clock as I do, then we are in concordance. If uh, someone happens to use the other clock, they might think I'm using the wrong clock, but they'll essentially know where I'm talking about in the labrum. So the communication of, of information is not interrupted. Okay, and when I look at the, the labrum, um, either you're looking on the axial or chrono, I generally have the sagittal up at the same time, and I use the sagittal as like a, a mini localizer. All right, Big, and we'll see in a second why it's so critical to know exactly what part of the labrum you're looking at. So if you see abnormal morphology or you see fluid signal clefts in the labrum, then generally that is a good indication that there's actually a labral tear. Okay, but if you see a quote-unquote labral tear in that anterior superior quadrant from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock and no abnormality elsewhere, then resist the temptation to call it a tear. Most likely it's a variant. All right? And we'll talk afterwards about how you can have labral pathology here, but when you're just starting out, if you see anything in this quadrant here, this anterior superior quadrant 12 to 3 o'clock, I want you to just call it a variant. So let's analyze this 12 to 3 o'clock position on the axial images. All right, so here we go. And this case actually nicely demonstrates one of the, the variants. So now we're, we're cutting through uh, 12 o'clock. This is our biceps. This is our biceps pulley seal. We see everything so clearly because of the distension from gadolinium. Now we're going to slowly scroll in fairly and look at where I am on the localizer. Whoops, wrong way. Okay. And we see here at about 1.30 or 2 o'clock that there's actually this this cleft here, okay? This is probably more like 2.30. So you might see a cleft in the labrum. You might see that the labrum 
looks like it's separated from the glenoid, I mean, any reasonable person um, would say, wow, that looks abnormal, that it's a detached labrum, okay? Or you might actually see that there's, it seems like there's no labrum at all in this location. So 12 to 3 o'clock, you see any of those, uh, those um, possibilities that I just outlined, those are all variants, okay? So this cleft here in the 12 to 3 o'clock position is called a sublabel foramen. If you see no labrum and you see a thick cord like middle glenohumeral ligament, that's this guy here, and just, just to show you where that is, this guy here between subscapularis and glenoid, another great OSCE favorite. Then you're actually dealing with a B-Ford complex, which is also a normal variant, so I generally don't dictate that there's a sublabel foramen or that there's a B-Ford complex, I just uh, refrain from calling it a labral tear. So what exercise do we go through to ensure that we're just dealing with variants? So whatever we're seeing, keep an eye on it, and then you'll notice that if it truly is a variant, then when you close, when you scroll down to 3 o'clock, there we go, you see how from these two images and then at 3 o'clock, magically, a normal appearing labrum reappears. So that's, that's essentially the exercise you go through to ensure that you're just doing a variant. Cleft, cleft, normal labrum. And no, look at that, we're right at 3 o'clock. Right? If you see a quote-unquote normal variant, but then you're scrolling down to 3 o'clock, 3.30, 4 o'clock, and you still see the quote-unquote variant, it's not a variant, it's a labral tear. So from 3 to 6 o'clock, no variants exist in this location. Anything abnormal here, you can call, okay? And it's important to note because a lot of shoulders and shoulder arthrograms are going to come to you, query instability, um, they may have dislocated in the past or they suspect that they've dislocated, and a lot of the relevant pathology actually happens in this quadrant, 3 to 6 o'clock. So that's why it's so important to go through this exercise, preferably with the axial, so you know exactly what clock you're at, before you, you so you don't avoid, so you don't call um, variants, tears, and vice versa, all right? And so that's an important analysis. Let's look at the chrono for a second, and the chrono, as I had mentioned earlier, is great for looking at the superior labrum. And there's actually another variant in the superior labrum uh, that needs to be distinguished from a slap tear, slap, superior labrum, anterior to posterior, fancy word for superior labral tear. Um, so how do we distinguish between a sublabel sulcus and a true tear? So the normal variant sublabel sulcus, you may see as a conscious fill cleft undercutting the superior labrum. But in general, it is A, going to follow the curve of the glenoid, okay? B, it's going to be of uniform thickness. Okay. C, its thickness is going to be 2 millimeters or less, not more. And D, classically, it will not extend posterior to where the biceps comes in and attaches to the labrum. All right. So if all four of those conditions are met, then generally you're dealing with a sublabel sulcus um, for the most part. Now there are some, there's some more recent literature that uh, actually debates whether or not all four of these criteria um, are 100% uh, reliable. For example, I can recall one paper that talked about how a normal sublabel sulcus can go behind the biceps tendon anchor. But for now, I think, just as a general guideline, I think those are good rules to hang your hat on for distinguishing sublabel sulcus from labral tear. So if you see a labral tear, what you might see is high signal that curves away from the glenoid, or that goes straight up, so that would be good for a tear. Or it either changes in thickness as you scroll back and forth, or it's more than two millimeters in thickness. All right. Um, so just like in the knee meniscus, we basically uh, go through the entire labrum on, on our axials and chronos, and we note the tears as we see them, uh, being mindful of these pitfall normal variants. Uh, if you do see a labral tear, then just like in, in the setting of a meniscal tear, it's helpful to see if there is a paralabal cyst. And if there is a paralabal cyst, it's also helpful to note if it extends into the suprascapular or spinal glenoid notch. Okay, so this is a far anterior chronal image, and you can see here a neurovascular bundle. The nerve here is the um, the suprascapular nerve. Okay, and in this location, that's this is a better look at the nerve. It uh, innervates supraspinous and infraspinous, and as we scroll more 
posteriorly on this coronal sequence, you're going to see that the quote unquote notch actually comes down a bit. At this point, it's actually the spinal glenoid notch. So it's kind of analogous to a street that um, keeps going straight, but then partway through, it suddenly changes its name. Okay, so anteriorly suprascapular notch, posteriorly spinal glenoid notch. And in this location, posteriorly, here it is on axial, it still is a suprascapular nerve, but it only innervates infraspinatus in this location. So if we see a perilabial cyst kind of insinuating into one of these notches, it's helpful to go back to your fluid-sensitive sequence and ask yourself, do you see diffuse edema involving either the supraspinatus or infraspinatus muscles, okay, or fatty atrophy? And those would be important secondary signs of suprascapular nerve entrapment. All right. uh, and that's, I think, pretty much a, a nice brief overview of labial assessment. I mentioned very briefly about the middle glenohumeral ligament um, and we talked about how it's a thick band interposed between subscapulars and the labrum. Uh, it can come off from the, it usually comes off from the anterior superior labrum, superior glenoid, it can come off lower and unfortunately these glenohumeral ligaments tend to have variability in terms of where they originate and also how their caliber and also whether or not you actually see them. We talked very briefly about the superior glenohumeral ligament. It's actually this guy here, just parallel to the biceps. Okay, I don't think it's critical to, to know too much about that. The one the one that's probably most useful to know about is the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament, which is actually difficult to see on this study. It's probably this guy right here. And it is the component that uh, runs from the proximal humerus kind of at the anatomical neck and it will come up and become contiguous with the anterior superior labrum. Just wish I could show it here. It's probably going to be around here. Um, it's not shown well on this study. But generally if you're dealing with a shoulder dislocation you should really look at that ligament as well as where it attaches to the labrum because a lot of the pathology, i.e. the bank heart lesions, are going to involve that. So a bank heart lesion is basically a disruption of that labrum at the attachment point of the anterior band of the inferior glenohumeral ligament and we'll leave for another lecture, you know, the alphabet soup of all the different bank heart type lesions that um, one may encounter. Uh, you may see disruption of the ligament from the humeral attachment, a so-called humeral evulsion of the glenohumeral ligament, so on and so forth. So you can see as I go through this how critical this 3 to 6 o'clock region is. All right. Great. Uh, let's see. So just getting back to our general approach, which is the focus of today's talk. Um, we talked about rotator cuff, we talked about biceps and how it's helpful to read it with subscapulars. We talked about AC joint, we talked about chromium, we talked about bursae uh, and how to distinguish subcorcoid bursa, which is extraarticular with subscapularis recess, which is intraarticular. Then we talked about glenohumeral articular cartilage and we brief overview of how to assess the uh, glenoid labrum. And so now we're getting to that point in the interpretation where we're just tying up loose ends. We're in the miscellaneous category. We're scrolling up and down. We're once again looking for lung masses. We're looking for axillary adenopathy. We're looking for muscle abnormalities, uh, bone or soft tissue lesions or masses, so on and so forth. We already looked at the localizer. And I'll just mention in passing, we had talked about the suprascapular and spinal glenoid notches while we talked about uh, labrum assessment, but you might actually also see mass lesions in the so-called quadrilateral space. In this space, uh, we see the posterior humeral circumflex artery and the axillary nerve. And so if you see an obstructing mass lesion here, you may see selective muscle edema or atrophy involving either the teres minor or deltoid muscles. All right, and because we like to ask in rounds so much, uh, the borders of the quadrilateral space include the teres minor inferiorly, sorry, teres minor superiorly, okay, teres major inferiorly, long head of triceps medially, it's this guy here, long head of triceps, and then humerus laterally, so it's this space here. You'll often, not often, but not uncommonly see selective atrophy or edema of just the teres minor with no obstructing mass lesion in the quadrilateral space. And I've always been coached to just chalk that up to axillary nerve traction. And to at this point in my career, that's still good enough for me. And um, that's generally how I explain that. So in summary, uh, approach to shoulder MRI, we look at rotator cuff, 
including biceps tendon, we look at the acromion, AC joint, acromomorphology, bursae, glenohumeral joint, including uh, labrum, and then miscellaneous. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I hope this was helpful.